few minutes ago, we were all sitting here silently. We kind of have gotten used to the idea that somewhere about 25 after 10, the broadcast will kick in and all of our conversations in the building from then on out for the next five minutes are broadcast over the internet. So we've kind of gotten used to kind of seeing that and saying, okay, let's, you know, let it calm it down a little bit and be a little more quiet. And all of a sudden it got very quiet. Mary was sitting over here and she said, okay, you know, you all can talk because there's something about silence that catches our attention. We're used to the business of the world. We're used to the sounds of the world going on around us. We're used to, most of us are used to a, a fairly engaging environment. And so when there is silence, it catches our attention. This morning as we move in a little while to looking at Mark chapter 15 as Jesus stands before Pilate, he is silent. And that silence catches our attention. Have you ever wondered why Jesus is silent? We're going to look at that question here in just a few minutes. In the meantime, you are all welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning, both here in the sanctuary at Cornerstone and online. For those of you who are joining us there, we are glad to be together in the name of the Lord, to worship him. Just a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. Uh, primarily, they're on the back of the little worship sheet. You were handed one when you came in. They're also available for those of you who are watching online. If you go to the live stream page on the website, and on the upper right-hand corner above the video player, there is a little click here for today's service order bulletin. And if you click on that, you'll get a PDF of this very page that I'm holding on to. And on the back of that, on the second page on your screen, on the back of the one that you all who are here got handed, in red are the highlights for what will be happening on Easter weekend. And so you will notice that on the 15th of, of April, uh, we will be having a Good Friday service here at 6.30. And then on the 17th, which is Easter Sunday morning, we will not only have our, our Resurrection Sunday worship here at 10.30, but also having a lunch together at 1045, and so you are all welcome to put that on your schedule and be a part of those uh, worship activities on that through that weekend. Let's pray together. Father, we come out of the mundane and the routine, and we enter into the presence of the extraordinary and the awesome. And so I would ask, Father, this morning as we are here, that you will focus our attention on the things that are not merely temporal, like this moment of worship, but eternal, like the significance of being able to stand in the presence of God Most High, the glory that sits upon the throne, and worship you without fear. That is because of Jesus. That is because in his life and in his death and in his resurrection, he has removed from us every reason that we might fear being in the presence of God. All of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt in Christ is gone. And so, Father, we pray as we worship this morning, you will continuously remind us of what you have done for us according to your great will and your eternal plan through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let our worship, though it is meager and ordinary, become holy and extraordinary by the working of your Spirit as you make holy what we bring, and you cause our sacrifices and our offerings to be worthy of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of songs we're going to sing together this morning as we continue in worship. Both of them are in the uh, Burgundy Colors Celebration Hymnal. You'll find them up on the screen uh, behind me. Number 492, we're going to sing together at Calvary. And number 312, Calvary covers it all. Let's stand together. Here's a spent in vanity and pro 
We go to prayer this morning. What would you like to pray about together? That's on your heart. Pat? Pray for the Lois and Scholl family. They're experiencing another, what looks like end of life for Kenny's brother John. Thank you for letting us know that. Up? Thank you. Others? Maureen? I'd like us to continue to pray for those who are going through uh, this pandemic and these normal, uh, kind of unusual crises of how we can actually move along uh, the, the responders and Anyone else? Judy? Yes. Uh, Mary's asking us to pray for Judy, who I see this morning is uh, having breakfast with her son and grandson at the Hilton uh, in uh, probably in Eden Prairie. Eden Prairie or Edina? Edina. In Edina. And so we want to continue praying for Judy in that transition for her. She was all smiles on Facebook this morning, so I'm hoping that it all goes well for her. Thank you, Mary. Others? Are you going to Haiti? Yes, I am. Would you like to tell us that you're going to Haiti? <laughs> um, yes, I leave on the 21st and come back on the 27th. And so it's just Cookie and I, and so um, we need a lot of prayers. <laughs> okay. Irene? I'd like us to praise the Lord that he has arranged a day that we will be speaking at his church for the Haitian people. I couldn't quite hear that last part. We're not what? No, I really couldn't hear. Winter is not going to last forever. Okay. Further south, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's pray together. Father, it is because you give us a perspective that is greater and grander and more glorious than our immediate circumstances that allows humor and relief and joy to flow. Lord, we can see the immediate, we can see the piles of snow here that are still 
over our heads in the parking lot. We can see difficulties like COVID that remain in the world. We can hear of wars and rumors of wars. And were it not for the fact that in Christ you have given us not only an immediate perspective on your sovereignty in this world, but you've given us an eternal perspective of your glory in eternity, Lord, that allows us to smile. It allows us to know that ultimately for us, for the world that you created, for the church that you bought with, with the blood of Christ, it will be well. And we rejoice in that today. We rejoice for the confidence that we have in the Savior and through the Savior. We are, are glad that in him all the promises of God are yes and amen. And we will take them for, at your hand, in your, out, of your, out of your hand, at your glory. And so, Father, we pray this morning with gratitude uh, for the fact that you walk with us. You walk with us even through the valley of the shadow of death. And we are mindful of Patrick's request this morning for Don. Uh, Lord, just asking that you will walk with him, sustain him, and keep him. Lord, I just saw him driving down the street the other day, and now to hear that he's had a stroke and is in the hospital, we are aware of how quickly change can happen in our lives. But you are changeless. You are consistent and continuous. You are from everlasting to everlasting. And we rely upon you. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll sustain that family as they go through yet another uh, life transition. But they do so grieving not as those who have no hope, but as those who in Christ have great hope and eternal hope. And we ask your blessing upon Don and upon his family. We pray as well this morning for Op's parents as they've been uh, exposed to COVID. We pray that they will not, uh, Lord, have any sign or symptom of infection, but will be able to pass through that with uh, good health. Father, we also pray as we pray for their good health, we pray for uh, a renewed spirit, a coming to Christ that will allow them to know you as you truly are. Jesus, as he was praying, said to us, as he's praying to the Father, he said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And Lord, we plead with you to reveal yourself to those hearts that don't know you, to grant faith to people, Lord, so they may believe and they may put their trust in you. Father, we pray with Irene for the caregivers in our community, uh, those not only who are involved directly with medical care and, and, and the providing service there, but we think, Father, of, of um, law enforcement officers, and we think of uh, restaurant and resort owners and all of those in our community who serve and serve one another. We pray, Lord, that you will strengthen them in these days. Uh, there are many who are exhausted and who are tired. There are many who live under the crisis of trying to find enough people to provide the services that they have provided in the past and not knowing where the people are going to come from. Lord, you know where you are leading us. You are confident in the plan that you are fulfilling, and our confidence is in you. So we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to sustain us and direct us in these days and watch out for those, Lord, who are uh, providing care for us May they be strengthened and empowered in the um, ministries to us that you have assigned to each of them. And Lord, we are grateful for changes of season. Uh, some of them we look forward to, like the changes in the physical world. Some are a little harder. And so we pray for Judy and this change of season that she's undergone as she's moved from here in Grand Marais now down to Edina. We pray, Lord, that you'll fill her with joy at the opportunity that you've now presented to her. And then, Father, we pray for Valida and Cookie as they head to Haiti again to Fountain of Christ uh, at the end of, of April. We pray that you will grant success to their labors there, that you'll pave the way for them, that their entrance into the country and, and their endurance while they're there for that week and their return home, that in everything they do, you will be powerfully present, bring glory to yourself and sustaining and keeping and multiplying their joy in you as they minister in your name to the people of Haiti and to Fountain of Christ in particular. Father, we continue to pray for our nation and for its leaders and the many facets of uh, life that, that they are engaged in and that their decisions and work impacts us. We pray again, Lord, that we might um, find that we have leaders who are, 
who are holy, leaders who are wise, leaders who are gracious, leaders, Father, who stand against corruption and instead, Lord, look for purity and justice in you and to be, to, uh, be able to bring it to us. Lord, we know that we're asking a pretty big prayer request right there. But nothing is too big for you. Nothing is, too, is, is impossible for you. And so grant, we pray, Father, all the good that is on your heart to do for your church, for your people in the world, for those that you're drawing to yourself. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, would you stand as we read Mark's narrative of Jesus as he stands before Pilate? And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate asked him again, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in their insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with a man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. Please be seated. They struck him and they 
makers too, and marked his holy name. Alone he suffered everything. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the Consider how they handled Jesus. The leaders, the scribes, the chief priests, they bound Jesus. They wrapped his hands in rope and then wrapped the rope around his arms. They delivered him over to Pilate. They handed him over to the authorities. Pilate questioned him like a common criminal. 
Pilate questioned him and the answers that he received moved him. Moved Pilate to defend him. But not enough that a moment later he wouldn't betray him and abandon him. And Pilate scourged him. You're familiar with scourging? Probably not personally, but perhaps you've heard of the Roman method of punishment by whip. A whip was made with lashes, leather strings on it. At the end of each string, there would be tied a sharp piece of bone or a little piece of metal. So that as the whip crossed the back and was retracted, it would not only be the beating of the lashes, it would be the digging in of the bone and the metal, so the flesh flesh itself would rip away. Pilate had him scourged and then delivered him over after the, ch- the crowd chose a murderer, delivered Jesus to death on the cross. Think about how they handled Jesus. The soldiers led him away. They crowned him with thorns. They mocked him. They struck him, they spit on him, they stripped him, and they too led him out to crucify him. Consider how they handled Jesus. And ask yourself, who is this man? Who is this man being bound and delivered? Mark tells us in chapter 1, verse 1, that he is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Throughout the gospel narrative, Mark will tell us that this is the Christ who expels demons with a word, who silences the wind and calms the sea. This is Christ who healed the lame and the blind and the leper. This is Jesus who fed the multitudes and taught the word with an authority like no other. This is Jesus who blesses little children and raised the sons of mothers and fathers from the dead. This is Jesus who rode the donkey and cleared the temple and confounded the authorities. John, in the opening of his gospel, tells us that this is Jesus who is the word of God. He is God. He is the creator. He is the life and the light of God. He is the glory of the only Son as from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the one who, having come from the Father, makes known the Father to us. And he is silent. He is mishandled. He is abused. He is beaten and accused. He is God and he is silent. How can God be silent in a moment like this? Now, don't get me wrong. He is silent, but he's not afraid. He is not silent as one who cowers in the corner, unable to speak out of fear and terror. He is not afraid. When Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? He doesn't stutter. He doesn't shrink back. You have said so, Jesus said. He's not reticent or reluctant. He doesn't try to negotiate his way out of this. And neither is Jesus' silence construed by Pilate as being belligerent. Perhaps some of you have had children in the midst of a tantrum, they're not getting what they want. And you ask something of them, and they just turn away. 
Pilate is the Roman governor. He does not need an excuse to crucify you. He can kill you just for being obnoxious in his presence. And yet he patient, patiently endures with Jesus and comes to the conclusion that Jesus is innocent and it is not because Jesus is silent is a belligerent rebuke. Instead, Jesus is confident. He is certain. He is composed. And he is calm. And I want to know why. How can Jesus approach this measure of rejection and humiliation and pain and death with such confident composure that convinces the Roman governor that he's innocent? How can Jesus be silent? Well, Jesus has already given us the answer to that question. It's in the previous chapter. It's the last sentence of the 14th ver- 49th verse of chapter 14. They're in Gethsemane. The soldiers have come. The chief priests have come. Judas is there. And Jesus looks at the people who are there to, to arrest him, and he says, are you coming out as if you're coming out against a thief? Have I not been in your temple? Have I not taught? Have I not healed? Have I not been gracious and good and kind and loving and compassionate? And then Jesus says this. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. He says, you could have taken me at any time. And you didn't. But let the scriptures be be fulfilled. What scriptures is he talking about? Well, he's talking about all of them. Every word of God in the Old Testament that hints at a Messiah, every single one of them that explains God's redemptive plan, every word that has proceeded from the mouth of God, he means all of them. But this morning, let me point out three that might very well have been in the mind of Jesus as he stands there, confident and composed and silent before Pilate. Three scriptures come to mind. One is a promise, one is a precedent, and one is a prophecy. The promise is found in Genesis 3, verse 15. You might be familiar with the, with the fact that Genesis chapter 1 describes uh, creation from one point of view. Genesis chapter 2 describes creation from another point of view. Genesis chapter 3 introduces the ruin of it all. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They have been given one command. God has given them just one law. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. It's the only law to head. Don't eat the fruit. Don't eat from that tree. And you know that um, there was a day when they came and they were in the vicinity of the tree. I don't know why they were there. Probably like the rest of us. If you tell me don't, I want to see how close I can get to it before before you slap my hand. Maybe that's what was going on. But instead of staying far away, they were in the vicinity of the tree. And the serpent called to Eve out of the tree and called to Adam who was there. And they said, hey, look at this beautiful fruit. Don't you want some? And Eve saw that it was pretty. And it was luscious. And it might be delicious. And she took the fruit, took a bite. Handed it to Adam. Now listen. Listen. God said, in the day that you will eat of it, you will surely die. Do you ever stop to think that Adam saw the transformation in Eve? Eve took the bite and suffered the consequences of spiritual death. 
And Adam saw it. And then he took a bite. Together, they turned their back on God. But God is not without a promise. And in the cur- so so Adam and Adam is cursed, and God and, and Eve is cursed, and then the serpent is cursed. And in the curse of the serpent, God includes a promise. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is that promise. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I don't know, but I think that's a verse that Jesus might very well have had in mind as he stood silent before Pilate. With every stroke of the whip, with every blow of the hammer, the serpent bruised the heel of the Savior. But with his death, the serpent's head is crushed. God's plan from before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world was laid, was that Christ would defeat Satan once and for all through his death. Can you imagine Jesus standing there, composed and calm, knowing that, yes, Satan is about to bruise him, but the result of what's going to happen will be the end of Satan's power over the people of God forever. Not only is there a promise, but there is a precedent that Jesus might well have been thinking of. Later on in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, God had promised an old man named Abram that he would have a son, an heir. Abram was 99 years old when Isaac was born. A few years later, God came to Abram and said, I want you to sacrifice your son. I want you to take an offering to me. I'm going to show you where to go. I'm going to take you up to a mountain, and I want you to sacrifice Isaac. Abram wrapped up the, the wood for the, for the um, sacrifice, took his knife, took his son, and they made the journey. Just as they were getting to the mountain, Isaac cried out and said, Father, Father, and Abraham said, I'm here. And Isaac said, Father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And this is what Abram says in Genesis 22, 8. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. God will provide for himself the lamb. I wonder, as Jesus is standing there before Pilate, calm and composed and certain and confident, if he is not thinking yes, That's exactly what God does. As Abram lifted lifted the knife to plunge it into Isaac's heart, fully believing that God would raise him from the dead because he was a child of promise, he looks over and he sees a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. God provided a ram. He provided a lamb for the sacrifice on that day. And I can imagine that Jesus might be standing there fully confident, knowing that he is the lamb of God's provision. The sacrifice for the sins of the world. God will provide for himself a lamb through the death of which God will keep his promises. There's a third scripture that I wonder if Jesus might not have been thinking. The first was a promise, the second was a precedent, the third is a prophecy. And you'll find that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. And if you've got your Bibles, I I would suggest you take a look at it. Isaiah 53 is the song of the suffering servant. Twelve of the most beautiful verses in Scripture relative to Jesus and the cross. Isaiah 53 verses 7 through 9 say this, He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, 
Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. He was silent, but innocent. And I wonder if the words of Isaiah 10, 53, 10, and 11 might also have been in Jesus' mind and heart that day. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquity. Can you not just see Jesus standing in the presence of his accusers, standing in the presence of the Roman governor, and thinking, the will of the Lord shall prosper in my hand. The glory of God will flow like a fountain in my life. How can Jesus be silent in this hour and bear the injustice and the arrogance of sinful men? How can he do that? Well, he can be silent because through the word of God, he had absolute faith in the power of God. Through the word of God, Jesus had faith in the rightness of God's, the Father's plan for salvation. Through the word, God had, Jesus had faith in the eternal plan of God to redeem lost sinners. Because through the word of God, he had absolute faith in the goodness of the Father's heart. Through the word of God, he had faith in the power of the Father's will. How does Jesus stand and face the worst evil that the world has to offer? How does God come in the flesh? God who could call 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. How does he stand and stand quietly, confidently, calmly in the face of an angry mob and a jealous people and a weak, spineless leader? How does he do that? The same way you do. The same way I do. Through faith In God. And what does this faith gain for him? Because Jesus remains silent. Because Jesus stood in that confident silence. We too. May have confidence through faith in God. Because Jesus stood there, because he did not call the hosts of heaven to come and destroy those who would have crucified him, because he went through and followed through on God's will for him, because of Jesus, the silent Savior, the suffering servant, Because of him today, we can have confidence in the forgiveness of sin. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How can that be true? It can be true because God will not dishonor his son. 
God will not dishonor Christ's sacrifice. God will not dishonor his own word. And God will not dishonor his spirit by failing to forgive those who confess and repent of sin and put their faith in Jesus. Because Jesus stood silent and went in faith to the cross, God honors both the intent and the fact of Christ's death. Jesus' death on the cross, cross satisfies every demand of divine justice. And it removes the indictment against us. And so God honors the intent and the fact of Christ's death for all those who put their faith in him. But not only can we be confident of forgiveness for sin, because Jesus remained silent and went through, we can be confident of eternal life. Jesus himself said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In our sin, we face death and the consequences of guilt, eternal separation from God. But in Christ, we face life eternal and everlasting joy. We have one other confidence on account of Christ. On account of the fact that Jesus remains silent and followed through on God's will, today we are confident of present power. If I quote Romans 8.28 to you, you'll know it. You'll, you'll have heard it before. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. There's another verse, just two verses before that, in Romans 8.26, that you really, really, really need to memorize. And it's really easy. It's really a simple verse. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. God is personally present in our vulnerability. How do I know that? Because Jesus stood before Pilate, silent, and like a lamb was led to the slaughter, Confident in God, he fulfilled God's purpose, which was that through his death on the cross and our faith in him, God might send his spirit to dwell in us. As Jesus stood there before Pilate, Pilate asked, him a, question, Pilate asked a question of the crowd that was gathered there. They were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? And you know what the answer to that question is? The answer to that question is none. It was not for any evil that Jesus did. That he was bound and delivered to the cross. It was for the evil that you did. It was for the evil that I do. It was not for any evil that he did, but the evil that we have all done. That Jesus was bound and delivered and crucified. Every careless, callous word. Every lustful, proud thought. Every angry, jealous rage, every dirty, murderous look, every selfish inclination, every godless action, every unholy moment lived in a rebellious indifference to the sovereign, righteous, and holy claims of God upon our lives, every self-exalting indulgence, every God-rejecting direction, these, these are the sins for which Jesus Christ, the Son of God, shed his blood and died on the cross. 
These are the sins for which Jesus was bound and delivered to be crucified. These are the sins, your sins and my sins, for which Jesus stood silent and gave himself in faith to God, being obedient even unto death. He did not die for any sin of his own. He died on the cross for the shame and the guilt of your sin, my sin, our sin. It was for the Father's glory. It was for the Father's glory and salvation and for our joy and salvation that Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, fulfilled the plan of God as the Christ of God. It was for our sins that he was bound and delivered and led away to be crucified. The mob that day, crucify him, crucify him. The mob only chose what Jesus in his silence had already chosen for himself. The glory of a full surrender in faith to the Father's eternal plan for salvation, which required his death. The mob chose to crucify Jesus. Jesus chose to endure death. But I asked you this morning, what will you choose? What will you choose? Will you like Pilate? having all the evidence of grace standing right before you, betray him, abandon Jesus, and walk away? Will you say, you know, that's a great, great story and lots of nice points there, but it's not for me. Not, not today. Will that be your story? Will you be like Pilate who bound him and delivered him over to be crucified? Or will you, like Jesus, put your entire tr faith and trust in God himself, in the rightness of God's plan, in the goodness of God's heart, in the power of God's will? What will you choose today? What will you do with what you've heard? Betrayal or faith? I urge you, put your faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, in a moment we will gather around the table where we will make choices. And a choice that we make in taking communion is to proclaim the death of Jesus until he comes. Lord, that death is meaningless for us until we put our faith in Christ. And so I pray that for each of us who will eat the bread and share the cup, that each of us might have our faith in Christ that we will before you confess our sins and repent and receive the forgiveness of those sins and the new life that comes to us by the Spirit through Christ. Lord, let it not be that none of us today will be like Pilate who saw the truth and turned away. But let us be those, Lord, who chosen and called, put our faith in you. We ask for your blessing as we worship you at the table. In Jesus' name.
Amen. night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. Passed it to, to his disciples. Instructing them to eat. Saying, this is my body. This is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
supper, Jesus took the, the cup, he gave thanks for it for, as well. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Let's stand together. Father, as we have offered you our attention and our devotion and our love this morning in this place, so now we offer you our commitment and our devotion and our obedience as we leave. Lord, let those to whom you give faith be faithful. Let us serve you in the power of your Holy Spirit confident in your word and full of faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.